rich tapestry of Harry Rowe Shelley's Fanfare for Organ, music from the turn of the century, La Belle Epoque, the Edwardian Age, played for us on camera three today by Virgil Fox, the reigning king of concert organists. La Belle Epoque, a glorious blend of refinement and elegance, and in politics of peace and stability. New technologies, new confidence that man was the reason for this earth. It was a beginning and an end. A happy 11th hour before the storm of World War I, which shattered it utterly. While it lasted, leisure and peace gave to a privileged upper class the best of all worlds. The strictures of the Victorian period were broken open in art, in architecture, in theater, dance, family life, all over Europe, people felt they were drawing new breath. Appearance and surface, they counted for a great deal. Gentlemen and ladies changed their clothes several times a day, and appropriate manners matched each change. What was done was worth doing right. It was a period of sensuousness and delight, racing at Ascot, Longchamp, the Ballet Russe, Boldini portraits, top hats and canes, Sachertorte, purebred polo ponies, and the last great displays of European royalty, the fastidious beauty of responsibility. Society was titillated by Freud, by women in bathing costumes, by the avant-garde music of Debussy. Art Nouveau, with its gorgeous exaggerations of nature, flourished side by side with the best of the old traditions. Nothing was too good for man. This desire to please the senses supercharged all the arts. And on the musical scene, 
the organ, the steady pulse of centuries of church music, also gathered new life. In keeping with the age, the organ found its possibilities growing with a new technology. Bigger pipes, stronger air-blowing machines, transformed it from the instrument of Johann Sebastian Bach into an environment to stun and delight. Today on camera three, La Belle Epoque as interpreted by the organ. The teachers of Virgil Fox, men like Louis Vierne, Louis Robert, Wilhelm Mittelschulte, were La Belle Epoque. They aimed for splendor. They wanted music to possess the emotions, and they had humor too. No one knows this time and this instrument better than Virgil Fox. Alexandre Guillemot was a great organist in Paris at the turn of the century. He played divinely and he composed very well and his style was so communicative that he was invited on several continents. My Aunt Etna, who at the marvelous age of 89 remembers a wonderful story about the St. Louis World's Fair connects with Gilmore, if you can believe that. She drew straws with my mother to see which one of them might be able to go to the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904, and she won. And she tells me that when Gilmore appeared on that stage, he walked from one side of the stage all the way across, bowed clear to the floor, and the white beard, which he was so proud of, stuck up in the air four feet. There is a wonderful story about Gilmore playing for Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle, and I would like us to think of this situation now while we have this wonderful marche religieuse composed by him. It seems that Victoria's birthday and Guillemot's were on the same day. It seems that Guillemot chose the magnificent theme, Lift Up Your Heads from the Messiah, for his composition called Marche Religieuse. And when the queen heard this, she insisted upon having a birthday party once a year where she sat in the magnificent Windsor Chapel and listened to Guillemot play her favorite composition composed by him. So at this moment, if you would like to pretend that you're the Queen of England, I should like to be Guillemot and go to the organ, and we will all be at Windsor.
Have you ever heard two brass bands playing two different tunes at one and the same moment? Charles Ives, American composer, also at the turn of the century, heard precisely this on a holiday in a small Connecticut village where there was just one main street and these two bands not knowing about each other. And when they came together, the sound was terrible. He, however, was intrigued. In all of his compositions, he has these unrelated, harmonic structures, one on top of the other. And in the variations on My Country Tis of Thee that I'm going to play for you now, there are devices where I'm playing at one and the same time, the same tune in one flat in one hand and in five flats in the other. Charles Ives was very annoyed about themes and variations. And when he wrote this piece, I am sure he meant it to be a great big travesty on the idea and if you listen to this with a long face, you'll be in the wrong pew. At the beginning of the piece, he makes an introduction that is a very much tongue-in-cheek affair. Listen for the innuendo as to what's going to take place. He plays the tune immediately after the introduction, just as straight-laced as can be without any emotion. First variation sounds like Jenny Lind singing, Lo, hear the gentle lark. Second variation is a chromatic squeeze. Third variation sounds like an actress casting out rose petals from a swing. In the fourth variation, if you've never heard My Country Tis of Thee played in a rumba tango rhythm in the minor key, watch out. For the fifth and final variation, he puts instructions for the player on the music. 
and it says in plain language, hold on to the bench with one hand and pedal it just as fast as it'll go. So will you now please fasten your seat belts for the variations on My Country Tis of Thee by Charles Ives.
Sir Edward Elgar, from his organ bench in Gloucester Cathedral, sent out to the world of the Belle Epoque some of the great tunes felt everywhere. Those tunes, transcribed for many a combination of instrument, found their greatest transcription for the organ, where in many a town hall, lacking a symphony orchestra, there was a superlative organ. I want to play for you now a tune that has involved every one of us. It has concerned you and you and you and even me because no one has ever lived without Pomp and Circumstance Military March Number 1 of Sir Edward Elgar. <laughs> 